Hello, you're listening to The Sower, a podcast of the Ciceronian Society. The Ciceronian Society exists to equip and encourage Christian scholars to serve the church as a center of cultural and civic renewal. Through our events, publications, and podcasts, we provide the space and opportunities that Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox scholars need for professional growth and intellectual discipleship. Since 2012, we have been building a network of friends with a love for our core themes, tradition, place, and things divine and with a genuine commitment to the church and the life of the mind. To learn more about us, our events, this podcast, our journal, Pietas, to sign up for our newsletter and make your tax-deductible gift, please go to ciceronianssociety.org. That's C-I-C-E-R-O-N-I-A-N-S-O-C-I-E-T-Y dot org. I'm Josh Bowman, Executive Director of the Ciceronian Society. And before we get started, please join me in prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray, O Lord, that you would bless our conversation, and all we say and do would bring glory and honor to you. Amen. All right, well, the the Ciceronian Society recently served as one of the sponsors for the annual Front Porch Republic Conference, a community and and a a magazine, a a publication whose connection to our group goes back many years, uh, to the beginning of both, actually. Uh, When I was there, I briefly met today's guest, Nathan Beacom, and learned about something called the Lyceum Movement, which he founded, or I guess you could say in one historical sense, he refounded, we, we could say, um, and he now directs this as well. Uh, he is also a writer and an essayist, and he lives in Des Moines, Iowa. Welcome to the show, Nathan. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Josh. Yeah, so now from what I've h- heard and read so far on the website and uh, in your talk and also, like, like I said, on the website, it's clear that this is something that Ciceronian Society folks uh, should know about. I think they'll be excited to know it even exists. Uh, so give us the brief kind of elevator pitch introduction of what the Lyceum movement was historically and what it is now. Yeah, so you mentioned kind of refounded, and our, one of our taglines is founded 1826, refounded 2021. Listeners to this podcast, you know, probably will be familiar with the word Lyceum, I think. Yes. The, the, the ancient school of Aristotle. In 19th century, there was a a farmer mechanic, uh, kind of polymath, I guess, in in Connecticut named uh, Josiah Holbrook, who wanted to start an institution for people to continue learning. And he said it it was for the diffusion of useful knowledge and for the elevation of the citizenry. And he wanted to provide education in the sciences, but also in the liberal arts for people who weren't of the cast that they'd be ending up at one of these Ivy League universities that was uh, that were around at the time. Uh, so he started the Lyceum as kind of a center of community learning with the goal of forming citizens who were capable of uh, sustaining a Republican form of government. And over time, this caught on. You know, if you read de Tocqueville, you, you, you hear him talking about how we're a joining society. We just love to associate and start clubs. and that was the period. So there were more than 3,000 of these lyceums across the country by the middle of the century. And they were kind of the center of public thinking and learning um, for the American public. And names you would recognize frequented the stage. Abraham Lincoln gave his first ever speech at the Springfield Lyceum. Uh, Frederick Douglass, Mark Twain, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Susan B. Anthony, all those folks. So this had a really big impact on kind of the public conversation and intellectual life in America for about a hundred years. I think it inculcated virtues of how to discuss and disagree well, how to talk with people who disagree with you. And it eventually kind of faded out, was replaced by different forms of media that individualized uh, our interaction with ideas. So it was between us and a radio or a TV or a computer screen. Uh, And these communal forms of, of intellectual life faded away. So, we, after the pandemic and kind of the extreme isolation and individualization that happened during the pandemic, we decided to bring this idea back for our own time uh, in 2021. So today, you know, kind of like the past, we bring people together uh, from all kinds of different backgrounds to create a sense of, of one common public conversation and engage with some of the deepest questions of human life. So. Yeah, I'll stop there. 
Yeah, I, I it's so interesting. I was I, I was going to ask you as you were talking. I'm like, why did this go away? But the obvious answer, as you said, is 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 the development of media and kind of individualizing mm-hmm. that interaction with the with the, the content. It, it make, makes you think of the whole um, uh, the, the the narrative of Neil Postman and the, the amusing ourselves to death. The medium is the message, yes. that kind of thing, where essentially we we've we we've developed media uh, mediums that have been. Uh, perhaps unintentionally anti-community mm-hmm. right the, I, the 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 tendency has been you know social networking online and, and a digital community it would a, a phrase that <laughs> makes me uncomfortable um the yeah and there's there's so much of a need for this and so getting back to what inspired you you said something about about covid um in particular were you um uh you know what what moved you to specifically do this uh, as as a response to that, right? We're all it's all these dig, digital, digitally. Mm-hmm. I'm having a hard time this morning. Uh, digitally mediated conversations. Um, we're like, were you uh, it, just uh, give a little background? Were you, were you in in college and doing this? Were you just you know working in Des Moines? What what happened that made you specifically go for this idea as a response? Sure. Yeah, and I, I'm glad you mentioned Neil Postman. He actually he has a, a page or two on the Lyceum in that book. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, and he he credits the Lyceum, if I remember correctly, for forming people such that you could go to a small town in Illinois and people could sit and listen to a two-hour discursive argument from Abraham Lincoln and then two hours from Stephen Douglas, right? And sustain that level of attention and and understanding, and and they weren't they weren't speaking in dumbed down tones, you know, they weren't mm-hmm. they they were. Uh, speaking in a really substantive way and people were ready to understand that. But as far as kind of the personal impetus or, or where I was, I had been working in Washington, D.C. Uh, and during the pandemic, actually, I transitioned to working, moved from Washington, D.C. to a small town of 800 people in Nebraska. And I think it was this confluence of factors where there was the pandemic and there was all this contentiousness around the election and the degree to which people in DC and, and in this small town in Nebraska lions lived uh, different lives, spoke different languages, had different conceptual worlds that they were living in. And even within this small town, it was becoming really difficult to have good public conversations. You know, there was a big issue was around, wind energy, wind turbines in Nebraska, and people weren't talking about it. There's no public venue to talk in, uh, about our, our ideas or our values. It was all, the debate was occurring by way of like Facebook comments and, and mean tweets and stuff. And so, so I think it was kind of this perception that we've just vacated the kind of public square, the forum where we can actually encounter people face to face and in a, in a communal way, talk about the ideas uh, that kind of compel us. And I think when we have public conversations, we're just bound to talk past each other because we've never laid any kind of baseline. We don't understand the words that we're using with each other. And so the Lyceum hopefully can provide that. And, and digital community, you know, it's there's a good amount of, of research on that and just kind of the anonymity and depersonalization of it. Uh, our view is that there's something about sharing life in a place with somebody and something about physical encounter, seeing the actual face, the eyes of the person uh, that improves kind of the humanity of, of the dialogue and promotes openness and understanding. We see that in our events where people come from widely different backgrounds, but um, are ready in the, in, the, in the space we create to really be open and, and seek the truth together. Well, with that in mind, then, that, that, that sense of place, of course, is important for us, and I think it's an mm-hmm. important piece of what you're doing here. I mean, there is the whole notion of a digital community or that digital conversation, even if it's among people relatively close to each other geographically, it seems mm-hmm. to decontextualize so much of what's going on. Um, and, and like you said, I mean, sometimes dehumanize. Mm -hmm. I, I, I used to live in a, in a small town in Ohio 
there might have been 60 people live this time. It's very small. And we, we, it would, when you brought up, you said wind energy, like a wind farm. I think we, I think our fight over, and I, I say fight, it really didn't happen, but um, it was either wind or solar. They were going to make a solar farm or a wind farm. And all, all I know that was happening was they were just, people had signs everywhere. Uh, the Midwest loves their signs, yeah. their yard signs, yeah. which uh, you cracking me. I, I live in Michigan now, but um, yeah, it's still the same thing. But I wouldn't even know had I wanted to have a conversation about that. I don't even know where I would have went. Uh, I think the best bet would have been in this particular context, there was this little general store uh, where these two women who basically ran the town of 60 people, there wasn't really much to run, but basically they were, I would have talked to them or I would just mm-hmm. sat in their general store until someone showed up. Now I didn't do that. Um, but <laughs> yeah. so and anyway, I, I want to hear a little bit more about who, you know, what, what, what has happened so far? How, how long you guys, y'all been around? About three years. Three years. So, you know, we're still figuring stuff out, right? Who, who has been showing up to this? What success have you seen? What kind of um, response have you seen to this? Yeah, it's, it's really neat, actually, because kind of the, the premise is that these, you know, questions, so we might have an event that's on more kind of on society and the common good, or we might have one that's more philosophical or kind of moral, ethical. And the premise is kind of what I think Holbrook's was originally, which is that people think about these things, all kinds of people think about these things, you know, in, in the quieter moments of their lives. And so we have had people used car salesmen or people that work at a freight yard, or we've had lawyers or doctors or hospital administrators, whatever. And I think the unique thing that we have that, that isn't any space, there's no space where you can find this, at least in our communities, uh, outside of this is like, we will have a 70 year old talking to uh, a high schooler about virtue ethics or, you know, this somebody who's working class talking with somebody who's kind of like upper middle class about uh, the common good and political, you know, what's the best political arrangement or whatever. So um, I think one of the big things that's been a success and historically, you know, some historians talk about the Lyceum as creating a public from a lot of tiny sub publics. And I think we have that compartment that the online life lends itself to that compartmentalization and I think one of the successes we've seen is that our events are never in a compartment. It's never, you know, this is for upper crust or this is for Republicans or this is for Democrats or this is for um, just the type of people you might expect to be interested in classical education or whatever. We get liberals and conservatives and people who are attracted to it for different reasons. And I think that, uh, I think that's good. I think it enriches the conversation. Yeah, and I, um, I can imagine a couple things here. Now, I, I, I want to get to your six habits of of a lyceum conversation. With it is is a really important piece of this, because one of the things that that strikes me as, <laughs> I mean, I, maybe I'm just skeptical or jaded. I don't know. I, when I hear what you're you're doing, uh-huh. at first I get excited, right? And I'm like, this is great. I would love to be part of something like this. I want to show up, but I can also imagine it getting hijacked. Mm. Now. What, what, what do I mean by that? Just think about when we go to like an academic, uh, if I go to some academic conferences or this or that event, you get people who, you know, they don't ask a question, they give a lecture, uh-huh. right? Or um, it might turn emotional in some cases, or it might get, um, you know, there's there's different things that could shut down the conversation. Mm-hmm. I'm curious, just on a, and this is almost a pedagogical uh, question in a way, and, I'm, and we can bring up the habits into this answer. How do we how how does like the Lyceum movement, how does anyone really help facilitate these conversations so that they are they're they're genuinely edifying, energizing, encouraging, and not dominated by one person or one group of people, I should say. Yeah. It's that's a great question. Um and there there have been uh there have been a number of different kind of iterations or attempts at this kind of like public intellectual engagement over over the last 150 years and um they've tried different pedagogical strategies and and one of them was uh the public forum movement which actually started here in des moines and its aim was to provide a venue where people could think seriously 
about public life, not almost in a way to kind of ground people in, get people an intellectual grounding that could withstand fascism and communism. So this was the 20s and 30s. And uh, these rising movements came about and there were people in America marching in the streets for fascism and communism at that period. And the public forum was uh, created to say, well, let's, instead of just marching and yelling, what if we got people uh, in a room together to talk about the fundamental kind of ideas about the basis of our society and, and kind of the hope of the people who sponsored it was that that would affirm uh, a Republican Democratic rather than a more radical ideological view. But um, the guy who started it, and it ended up being national across tons of cities, millions of people were involved. The guy who started it, John Studebaker, has wrote a guide for different cities doing these public forums, and he lays out like the six type of six types of annoying questioners <laughs> and how to handle them. And that it's sounds so great. funny because it's yeah, it's, it's it's exactly what you still see at conferences and stuff, and it's like you know, there's the prophet who just want, came with his idea and wants to expound his thing, and it doesn't matter what everybody else is talking about. And there's the fake questioner, you know, the guy who says he has a question but doesn't. And, um, so it's pretty funny, and that stuff can happen. But I think a lot of it is about setting the stage. So, you know, we, we set the stage of what the space is and kind of aspirationally, that kind of that description I just gave you, we kind of, we're kind of calling people to that idea of like, this is a place where we can kind of transcend those differences and see ourselves as fellow searchers, uh, uh, you know, looking for truth. And then we'll, you know, we have people, these speakers are experts who kind of start the conversation before, before people uh, have the opportunity to engage in the dialogue together. And uh, so a lot of the stage setting is about selecting those people who can model it well. We will have people from different backgrounds who are able to model a generous and non-ideological way of engaging. And then finally, the habits, like you mentioned, we affirm those publicly. Those are kind of virtues that we're trying to develop. And we say them at the outset so people have them in mind and they're, they're generally agreeable. So people want to want to live up to those virtues as they speak and, and know that they're kind of going to be held to those virtues by others. And so just to quickly, what a couple of those are, one is to speak for the sake of truth and understanding rather than victory, setting the stage that a conversation is not about winning. Um, to think of yourself as fundamentally on the same team with people, even when you disagree, we're part of a common community, a common project in some way. Another is to read your neighbor's words in the most generous light you can, to try to give them the most sympathetic and generous interpretation. And another is just to look for something to love, look for something admirable. You know, even in somebody who might frustrate you and, and make you uh, angry or who you might deeply disagree with, there's probably something you can find to ground some kind of admiration uh, and, and have some basis for mutual respect. So those are a few of the virtues. Um, and we found that, you know, kind of to our surprise, even on stuff that might turn contentious, we've, we've never had it devolve into a shouting match or, or dominated by any one point you it's really it's really actually been encouraging what you need though is you probably you, you need some some miscreant like myself who just comes in and, <laughs> and stages a shouting so that we just see how you handle it right it's more of just a grow i'm just kidding <laughs> um <laughs> yeah just imagine yeah i uh I, I don't I don't know what those six types of, of questioner or whatever it was that come to these meetings i'm the one who wants to crack a joke because i can't be serious for too long <laughs> that that's encouraged <laughs> that's right that's encouraged good I, I you know i honestly that might be a uh a seventh habit i'm not sure you want to encourage it too much um mm. levity right i mean just in the same sense of yeah the, it, don't you know and this is something that as our, our friend claire uh she sure. she's described the ciceroian society as a group of people who take their faith seriously their scholarship seriously but not themselves seriously um, and I think that's that's what we uh, uh, go for. Um, you're looking at these six habits, and I I'm really encouraged by these. And if y'all are listening, you know, go to the Lyceum Movements page. It's l y c e u m movement dot org. Uh, that's two m's in a row. So Lyceum Movement dot org, um, and uh, you know, uh, navigate to their six habits. And 
th these are really good. I think these could be used in a classroom. They could be used in a church setting. They could be used in a lot of different places where it makes sense. And it makes me think of, you know, one, one of the things in, in politics that's sometimes frustrating, though, is that <laughs> it was a libertarian who said this, and I can't think of who it was. He said something to the effect of, those who want to uh, be left alone will always lose to those who want to win. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's there's an aspect of of there's a fear that if we don't think of things in terms of winning, if we don't think in th uh, of of these arguments in terms of teams, that we we may be we may actually lose to people we really don't want to lose to. Mm -hmm. And I think that gets to a point where I I I. I'm going to give some fake pushback here in a sense. I, I agree with what this is saying, but let, let, let's pretend I don't. So, sure. you know, we see uh, uh, habit number three says, see our, we see ourselves as fundamentally on the same team, even with those who disagree. What do we do in, in, a, in a context like this, a Lycia movement conversation, when there are genuinely irreconcilable, mutually exclusive um, differences? Because I, I inevitably they're going to come up, right? Yeah. I, th I think of like some, something like like abortion. I don't know if you covered that yet. I mean, I think you can get to a point where that's that's going to come up. Mm -hmm. How 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 have you how's how's the movement handled those those, those moments? Yeah, it's a great question. So we are as far as like what we actually cover in our events, we we stay away from kind of the the current hot button stuff for the most part. Yeah. Rather than talking about one of those issues, we talk about some kind of component element in those issues. So we might have a conversation about justice or human dignity or or human rights or whatever, you know, some some kind of more fundamental concept that would play into other discussions. And it's it's, uh, you know, the, the, it's not limitless, you know, that that you're on the same team with somebody. It's the presumption that you're acting in good faith, you know, that the other person is, is in good faith when they disagree. And so everybody in the conversation is kind of making an agreement to be on the same team, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, okay. And if somebody, if somebody violates that or isn't willing to make that agreement, then they, they really might not be, you know. So if you had somebody who uh, wanted to like pursue violence or political violence, you know, that would be outside the bounds of conversation. Um, right. And so we, we have had abortion come up in the context just kind of organically once or twice in the context of, uh, of group discussions. And it would be a question of, okay, this is a matter of deep disagreement, but is the other person of goodwill? Do they have what to them is a compelling set of reasons why this is good for the common good, you know? And so that's what I mean by good faith. Is this person of, of goodwill or not? And if the person is of goodwill, then we can, we can try to find some kind of starting point for conversation. And we might not agree, but what we see is that people will have a better understanding of why people have arrived at the conclusions they've arrived at. So I think it's important not to see political opponents as enemies and to not presume bad faith or, or ill will unless we have good evidence for it, but to have the presumption, first of all, that the person is in good faith and acts of goodwill until proven otherwise. I think the idea that we have to just win and do battle is a form of despair in Republican government. It's a form of despair in the power of reason, the power of conversation. And when we despair too much of the possibility of conversation and of convincing uh, rather than just beating, uh, then we give up on Republican government and all we're left with is kind of force and compulsion and a back and forth battle that that doesn't really have a conclusion that doesn't really have an endpoint besides more battle. So the presumption is that Republican government is good and 
it's good because it allows us to try to navigate differences in peace without um, going to war with each other. And I think with what what the Tocqueville and what the founders of this country said is that to be able to sustain that requires the development of virtue and requires this kind of grounding that hopefully the Lyceum can help provide. To have a healthy republic, you know, would, would require these virtues of public dialogue and also engaging with just kind of the virtues, the classical virtues, developing those. So, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's a little bit rambling, but hopefully responds to your question. No, it's helpful. And I think there's, it brings to mind, this is a little off topic, but I, I, I want to share it anyway, is, you know, at our, at the church I work for, which is my other part-time job, I, we've been going through this a study called Emotionally Healthy uh, Discipleship. Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, uh, developed by a guy named Pete Scazzaro over in New York City, and he, um, it, there's also another thing called emotionally healthy relationships. And I, I recommend it to our listeners and to you in, in, in a sense where that um, this um, sense of emotional health, um, and of course he's he's teaching it primarily in a Christian context, but I think there's a lot that could be applied beyond that, um, where without that emotional health, a lot of these discussions would, would be difficult to have. When mm-hmm. I first read the book, I just... I, I I recoiled. I put it down. I was like, "This is dumb," because I I just I'm allergic to essentially a kind of in a Philip Reef sense therapeutic nonsense. Sure. But then I re- reread it again in, in in a community, which by the way is I think is part of what's going on here. When you hand when you deal with these things in community, you genuinely see them differently. Yes, it, it, you could you, you could read the exact same book by yourself and then with another group of people, and it will be a completely different experience. Um, and I think uh, that that's that was what happened with this emotionally healthy discipleship thing. But also, um, I, I think that that's that's what you're going with here. I want to move, and you feel free to to respond to that. Um, but I also wonder more about where this movement is headed, like how, and how others might get involved. You know, if someone's listening to this, and they're like, "Do I have a Lyceum movement near me? Um, could I start one? Um, what, what would that look like?" Yeah. So I'll, I'll respond, or I say I'll say one thing just briefly on the, sure. the emotional, the emotional health or emotional maturity. Um, I think uh, I think you're exactly right that having the conversation in person, whether it's based on a text or something you've just heard from a speaker, allows you to put yourself. You we naturally put ourselves behind the eyes of the person we're talking to, and that's good. It's a different angle on the same thing, and. And with respect to truth rather than victory, you know, putting truth as paramount allows us to confidently get outside of our own ego and our own sense of threat and to say, well, the criterion here is truth. I'm going to look at it from my angle and look at it from their angle, and I'm going to go for the truth. And if I'm serving the truth, I, I don't have to feel at risk of abandoning what is true and good, you know, if I, if I'm. If I let go of this idea of winning is the highest value, but truth is the highest value, I'm not going to lose anything. And okay, so the second part, um, how do people get involved? Uh, they can go to our website. Um, there's there's an email address there if people are interested in starting a chapter. We have chapters in other cities besides Des Moines and Minnesota and Michigan. And uh, yeah, they would just reach out and we have kind of a, a, a way of, of helping people and assisting them and getting set up with our manner of doing events, with our curriculum, um, our, our kind of slate of, of things that we do in a given year of events. Um, and this is what happened historically too, is people just kind of took leadership. Uh, I think people have tried like civil dialogue things or whatever, bridge building things that really not very effectively. They, they've come from uh, universities or think tanks and people try to like plant them in small towns. Our way of thinking is that it only happens if it happens organically from people who are take leadership in their own community. And so if there's somebody in a community who has that kind of leadership and, and wants to bring it to their town, they can reach out. We're happy to get them started. And we would love someday if, uh, like in the old days, Communities had this kind of public space. Um, I always say people, communities have places to work out together, to, to make money, to do all these different things. But we 
so often lack a place to kind of pursue one of the highest things of human life, which is looking for the truth together. That's really great. I, it actually, um, you know, the, the idea, I don't know if you, you don't know if you said it this way, but the idea of screening the people who are going to lead these things, I think is important because you know, if someone just comes to a new town, they're like, I'm educated and I want to start a license. <laughs> I don't yeah, know anyone yeah. here. Uh, this this isn't going to work, right? right. Um, in, in, in understanding who the key players in the history and traditions are, there, I think is really important. There's, have you read? Um, there's the book by uh, Seth Kaplan, "Fragile Neighborhoods." Uh, I I haven't read it, but I I know Seth a little bit and and have heard him speak, so um, I know the general gist of it. Yeah, and his I, I think I think his work's great. We're actually going to have a panel on it at the upcoming conference. Um, in which I'll talk about shortly, but I think he, he, I can't remember what he calls them. There's a specific name he gives to those key players Mm -hmm. in uh, a given community. And when they, in in his context, when they address certain poverty or uh, social issues, they're the ones who have more success because they're the ones who seem to know everybody. And also they don't just know everybody. They know how to talk uh, in that particular town, in that particular context. And, mm-hmm. um, I, that is so important because even as, even as the digital world has in some ways homogenized and, and, and encouraged us to forget about regional and local per- particularities, they, they are still there. Yeah. Maybe less so than, than, than we, we remember, but I, they, they are still there. I mean, I know here in West Michigan, and I know that this happens in Iowa too. Like this, this is very, very Dutch <laughs> area. Yeah, yeah. And there is a, and I don't mean that in a critical way, of course. I am very not Dutch, and <laughs> so <laughs> trying to navigate that, that yeah. language, that personality, that mindset, that tradition, has been interesting. Like I could not, I could not start it here in what in 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 Holland where I live mm-hmm. because I, there's just no way I could. Now we have a university here, so there's a little more. Mm-hmm. There's there's opportunities there to, that um, there's already community and kind of ready to uh, adopt something like that, and you get the right leader, and I think it'd be really interesting. So I, I want to conclude now with one last question. The Ciceroing Society is a Christian organization, as I've mentioned, Protestant, mm-hmm. Catholic, Orthodox. I'm not suggesting you do a uh, <laughs> Lyceum movement conversation on something like transubstantiation. Sure. That's not really what we're going for here. Although there are, there's a similar group. You may have heard of the Colossian Forum um, mm-hmm. that is dealing with you know, faithful conflict, specifically in a church context. Hmm. But one of the things I have to imagine was part of the original Lyceum movement, and uh, and and I would imagine is is part of it now. Is this this role of religion, and are these religious traditions and religious particularities? I'm curious how it has come up already, religious differences, religious assumptions, Mm -hmm. in the different contexts you're in? Yeah, it's a great question, and I think we we, we are trying to embody like a a different idea of secularity, I guess, where... Hmm, Okay. Yeah, so so we are, in in other words, secularity, I just mean by that being non-sectarian, that we are not a specifically right. Christian Catholic space. Mm-hmm. But what, what I think that typically means secularity is that we're, is, is that idea of like a kind of a practical atheism. We're just going to not talk about God and we're going to leave all of that in private life. And it's, it's too dangerous and it's too subjective to talk about, I think would, would maybe be the normal way. Our point of view is that if we're pursuing the truth and we're pursuing the deepest questions of human life, the question of God and the question of meaning are some of the deepest elements of of doing that. And we should be not afraid to talk about God, to talk about religion, to talk about faith in a public setting where people are coming from different perspectives. And I think that's a thing that's really missing is the idea that we can we can do that. We can engage seriously with seeking for the truth about God and meaning uh, without people feeling like they're being proselytized, proselytized to or somebody's trying to get them to join their, their group. And, and I think if, that's, if you have that non-threatening approach, then people can engage in what is going to always be a universal, enduring question of human life, questions about God. Uh, questions about the spirit 
And so, you know, it, it, I think this was, this was sort of the attitude. I mean, the country had a different dynamic back in the day, obviously. So there was kind of just a more baseline presumption of Christianity. And even today, most people in America are adhere to some, some kind of Christian idea. Um, we've had priests as speakers, rabbis, uh, Muslims, Sikhs. And I think, I think generally we, you know, when we're looking back to, to the sources, if you will, of some of these ideas, and we, we have kind of a, an approach that we're going to really try to draw from the great tradition of thought. Um, and that's not just the Western tradition that, that includes Confucius and Mengzi, uh or Avicenna, whatever. And God is central across all of these different traditions of thought. You, you kind of can't eliminate this question. Um, so in other words, it's kind of on this, this natural level, if you will, it's not on the level of, of explicit Christianity or revelation, but on this natural level of seeking the truth, God has always been a part of the conversation and we want to make, make it okay to talk about that in a place that is public and a place that is diverse and has disagreement. And so, it, yeah, religion, religion comes up and people, I think, have felt open to speak from the resources of their religious tradition and people who haven't encountered religion or who are skeptical are encountering people for the first time, you know, somebody who's like very secular liberal might for the first time talk to somebody who goes to traditional Latin mass or uh, to, to the rabbi, Rabbi Jacobson here. So I think our approach is kind of this, this different version of what the public square can look like in a pluralistic society. And also this, this general conception, you know, we're shaped like the country is by kind of these general kind of Judeo-Christian premises. I think you could call them Abrahamic premises to a certain degree. And, and I think it extends even more broadly, like I said, to, to traditions in the East. And there's a famous court case where it was about school prayer in the 50s. I, I think it was called Zorak, Zorak versus Claussen. And it was, you know, can we end public school early to let kids go to their Wednesday night church group? And the conclusion was that it doesn't violate this idea of kind of a, a pluralistic, non-sectarian society to believe that it's worth encouraging spiritual life. It's worth encouraging religion. Uh, and one of the things it says in that decision is that our institutions and our public life are based on the presumption of a supreme being. So this is kind of like a basic natural commitment that's non-sectarian and I think is generally actually quite acceptable. Even today when religious affiliation has declined, belief in some form of, uh, some conception of God, I think is like 90 plus percent in the country. So anyway, I think, uh, I think, yeah, that's, that's also another kind of rambling, uh, circling answer, but hopefully gives you a, a picture <laughs> no. of, of how we approach it. I think that makes sense. I mean, it's, it's, it's a way of saying we're, we're taking religious seriously, but we're not, there, there's certainly no coercion. This isn't, you know, I think what, one of the problems today is you get the, any talk of religion is uh, <laughs> Christian nationalism or something. Right. Um, but, you know, there, there is a kind of overreaction against the religion, but there's also this, you know, we, we don't want to, I, you know, as a Christian, I don't, I don't want these spaces to be taken over by people who think there's only one right way to, to say these things. Now, do I believe there's, you know, there's certain uh, ex ex uh, truths that are exclusive to Christianity? Yes, of course I mm -hmm. do. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that I need to, um, you know, shout in someone's face until they agree with me. And I think there's there's so much room and space for what, what you're doing, and I'm so encouraged by it. It's the kind of space that, you know, wherever I end up, I would love to know that this exists. Just like you said, you know, there are 3,000, 3,000. Yeah. <laughs> I had no idea it was that many. Yeah. And uh, it's it's amazing that, you know, it also shows 
how important it is to recover these kinds of movements, recover these kinds of ideas. Um, they can they can disappear quite quickly, apparently. Mm-hmm. And they're so valuable, they're worth conserving. Well, Nathan, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate this. Yeah, thank you so much, Josh. It's, it's been great to talk with you. Yeah. Um, if you uh, So you've been listening to The Sower, a production of the Ciceronian Society. And if you've enjoyed this conversation, if you're the kind of person who would go to a Lyceum Movement gathering, we hope you'll consider joining us for our 2025 conference, March 13th through the 15th at Hotel Madison in Harrisonburg, Virginia. That's right next to the campus of James Madison University. Sponsorship opportunities are also available if you or your organization are interested in doing that. Um, Space is very limited in terms of registrations. We're limited to about 150 attendees, uh, and we have about 130 panelists. So if you're interested in, in signing up for that, please do so as soon as possible. It's going to be a great conference, easily our biggest one ever, um, and uh, it is always a great time. We are growing, lots of exciting things happening. Uh, I would love for you to be a part of it. Now be sure to rate and review this podcast, share it with your friends, and check out our website at ciceroneansociety.org. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Thanks for listening.